Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. If you open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 1, we just began our series last week in the book of Acts, and we learned that Luke is the author, and he's a doctor, and he's writing this book, and he wrote the Gospel of Luke as well to help his friend Theophilus know the truth and feel the confidence and the firm foundation that everything he's been taught is truth so that his faith is cemented in that truth as well. But one thing I mentioned last week that I want to reiterate is that someone had to reach Luke, right? And so the disciples and the apostles uh, ministered to Luke and he believed in the gospel message and was saved by this good news. And so right away, Luke... Uh, find someone that he can pour out into and share the gospel with, and he decides to write two books of the Bible to help uh, his friend Theophilus as well as all Gentile believers uh, that would be saved because he was a Gentile too, and so God was using him and inspiring him to put this in writing for all of them. And today we're still being impacted by this story and by the, the gospel and the scriptures of Luke and Acts. And we're in Acts chapter 1, and I'm going to begin actually with verse 1 again, and we're going to start climbing through and going through our scriptures all the way through hopefully verse 11 today. So let's begin in, in Acts chapter 1, and I titled this message, The Promise of the Holy Spirit. The Promise of the Holy Spirit. And that is also the title with most Bibles as well. In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he taught to them about the kingdom of God. Verse 4. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is Jesus talking, and he's eating with them, probably around a fire, maybe some roasted fish. Sound good? and some bread, and they're eating. And uh, we believe in the full bodily resurrection of Jesus. So Jesus' whole body was resurrected. It wasn't just a spirit resurrection. It was a physical body, uh, which, by the way, is harder to prove, isn't it? Think about this. If it was only a spiritual resurrection, how do you prove that if you can't see a spirit? But Jesus rose, again, full bodily resurrection. Our Christian doctrines, we believe that it was his whole body. We know that because he also got hungry and wanted to eat after he rose again. And so he's eating and, and having fish or something with them. And he begins to tell them some instructions. And he says, do not leave Jerusalem. Now, you know, if you're a realtor, location, location, location. Location is everything here because the mission of the gospel, the mission of the good news was meant to spread from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. First to the Jews, the Bible says, and then to the Gentiles. So whenever you read that, it's actually a missional statement that it's first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles, first to the chosen people of God, and then God included everyone else. So now to everyone else as well. Now, until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before, Jesus said, I, I told you this before. What is he referring to? Well, on the screen, we'll have John 14, 15 through 17. He was with them before he was uh, uh, betrayed, before he was um, killed on the cross. He says, if you love me, it was actually the same time they were having the Last Supper. If you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He's referring to the Holy Spirit. He is the Holy Spirit who leads 
into all truth. How many want the truth today? I know I do. And the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth, especially the truth that Jesus is the Son of God. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him, but you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. The Holy Spirit was working with Jesus. The Holy Spirit was in Jesus, and so they watched the Spirit of God working through Jesus, but soon the Holy Spirit will be inside of you, dwell in you. Luke 24 49, he also says, I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. He's referring, referring to the Holy Spirit. He wants his disciples to have power before they begin their ministry. You know, that's also the same thing with Jesus. There was two things that happened to Jesus. He was tempted for 40 days in the desert, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit before he began his ministry. Why? Because he was fully God, fully man. He had to go through the same things we had to go through and be victorious and never sin. But he also had to depend on the power of the Holy Spirit just like we do. Did you know that? Did you know that Jesus also had to depend on the Holy Spirit even though he is fully God? But he's also fully man. So this is the promised gift of the Father the power of the Holy Spirit to help the church be effective witnesses of the gospel. The infilling power of the Holy Spirit is a gift to be received, not necessarily earned. The only way someone can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit is to be saved and then to seek and receive this gift. More on that as we close the sermon today, but let me go forward in verse five. Again, it says, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. This idea of John's baptism and, and baptism in the Holy Spirit being two different things was actually mentioned years before by John the Baptist. John 1.33 says, I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one on whom you see the spirit descend, and that spirit was a dove, and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So the one on whom you see the spirit, or a dove, descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So Mark 1.8 says this, I baptize you with water, this is John, but he, Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is John the uh, Baptist prophesying that it will be Jesus who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. So you ready for this? Jesus baptizes you in the Holy Spirit. I'm going to share that uh, moving forward here as well. But what does the word baptize mean first? Let's, let's tackle that. The word baptize suggests immersion, such as fully covered or fully underwater. So we, yesterday, I did a water baptism for some people at a pool, and it was awesome. They're members of our church, and a family opened up their pool, and it was important that we went fully underwater because we believe in the full immersion of baptism in water. And so we went all the way under, and we held them there really long. No, i <laughs> Just kidding, just kidding. Their family likes to give us a rap sheet of how long, you know, their past life was like, you know. No, I was joking. But we, we went under, and, and we came back up out of the water, and that's full immersion. Physically, with water, that's pretty cool to see, but you don't necessarily see that with a baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's interesting, right? It's a spiritual experience. So baptized in the Spirit also means to be immersed or dipped or saturated in the Holy Spirit. And the word here refers to like a garment that's like put inside of, of a vessel with liquid and it just saturates all of the liquid. Anyone do tie-dye by any chance? So just imagine tying up a shirt and putting it in a bucket and just holding it all the way in there, not just dabbing it on the top and around, but putting the entire shirt inside of the, the coloring. That was, that's what it's like to be baptized in the spirit as well. The English 
preposition, I got to get a little grammar on us here real quick, uh, with, W-I-T-H, is the translation of the Greek word en, E-N, and is often translated as in. So you may see some scriptures that say baptize with the Holy Spirit, but that also implies in the Holy Spirit. So some people may, be, may read the scriptures baptized with the Holy Spirit. So, the, the, so the Holy, or Jesus uses the Holy Spirit, and with the Holy Spirit, you are baptized and filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And then other uh, translations, and sometimes it's just read in the Holy Spirit. So when you're reading through the book of Acts, I just wanted you to know you'll see with or in, and most times they imply the same thing, to be baptized in the Spirit. Baptisms require three things. Let me show you those. Number one, the candidate being baptized. So the person being baptized is you. The element we're baptized in. So there's two baptisms that we're talking about today, water or spirit. So you can be baptized in water, that's the element, or you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the agent baptizing you uh, in the spirit baptism, it's Jesus. So when someone's baptized in the spirit, it's Jesus giving you his Holy Spirit, filling you and saturating you. If it's water baptism, it's a disciple, someone in your life, like a, a father figure, mentor, uh, mother figure, whatever, or it's a pastor. So yesterday, um, I watched a son baptize his parents. That was pretty neat. That's pretty special. And he's a disciple maker here at church. He's winning the lost. He's going after lost, helping them believe in Jesus Christ. And then I was there to help oversee it. And I also got to baptize someone that I've been praying and, and working with as well. Um, and he also received the Lord and was baptized. It was a really great time together. So that's how that works. You have the candidate, you have the element, and then you have the person who baptizes. So guess what? Jesus wants to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. It's not a scary thing. It's actually what Jesus wants to do. Jesus wants to give you the Spirit's power to help you be witnesses. So with that said, and, and let me make sure I help you understand this key thing that a lot of people can get confused with, is that the Spirit baptism is separate from salvation. All right, the Spirit baptism is separate from salvation. Uh, it's a distinct and separate experience from salvation or spiritual birth. We receive the Spirit upon repenting of our sins and putting our faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. I have references for you if you want to look those up. All our notes are online as well. But we receive the Holy Spirit upon salvation because we are cleansed and washed of our old life and we're sanctified or set apart as holy by the Holy Spirit as soon as you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, okay? So it's a separate experience. Okay, you might be asking, well, when did the disciples then receive the Holy Spirit? Because Acts 2, it looks like the Holy Spirit came upon them there. Actually, John 20, when Jesus had resurrected and before he ascended, he had given them the Holy Spirit. Let's go to John 20, 19 through 22. I'll have it on the screen for you. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you. He must have scared them. <laughs> As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and in his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. And again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So we believe that this is the moment that they received the Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit, to go with their salvation experience, their faith in Jesus Christ. This is when they received the Spirit to mark them as a child of God, that they are saved, that they are, are regenerated and born again by the Holy Spirit. So with that said, some of us could actually illustrate the, uh, some of us like to illustrate the baptism in the Holy Spirit a little differently. Instead of taking the shirt and dipping it in the water to represent the saturation or immersion, 
Imagine an empty vessel that's clean, and the Holy Spirit is already dwelling in there into, into the very top. But when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit or in the Holy Spirit, God pours out even more, and there's an overflow of the Holy Spirit. I think that's a great image because you already have the Spirit of God in you, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the power of the Holy Spirit to help you touch and minister and be effective witnesses to those around you. When you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, the works of the Spirit begin to flow out of your life. When he, when he gives you the power to be witnesses, you are a different person. When someone bumps into you, they bump into someone who's like Jesus, who's acting like Jesus, talking like Jesus. Hey, I've been sick. Well, let me pray for you for a healing right now in Jesus' name. <laughs> that kind of person. You know, someone who's passionate about seeing the lost. When the Holy Spirit comes over you like that, there's this overflow of the Holy Spirit, and there begins to be works of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit shows up a lot more too. Okay, so I like that illustration a little bit better, um, but I think both are good. There's, uh, the, God is like a flowing river. He never stops flowing, okay? So whether you jump in that river and you're saturated and immersed and you're baptized with the Holy Spirit or whether God comes over your life and pours over you, again, this is all spiritual, right? So you can't see it. So what's one of the signs? Well, there's actually two major signs in the first two chapters. We're going to cover one of them as we get further into Acts 2. But the first sign that we believe is uh, people will pray in tongues. I didn't want to unpack that too much right now, and here's why. Jesus never mentions you'll pray in tongues. Did you notice that? Have you read that when he keeps saying, wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he never says, and you will begin to pray in tongues. He never says that. But that is the initial sign that takes place in Acts chapter 2. But the other sign is you'll be radical witnesses for the Lord. You'll be on fire for the Lord. You'll want to help people know Jesus Christ. And you're ready to talk to people about your faith and the gospel. So Jesus says uh, all this to them. And then they, you think that they would have questions about what that is, right? You know, hey, Jesus, what, is the, what do these things mean? And instead, their mind's on something else. So let's go to verse 6 and 7. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. So they're thinking, okay, hey, you're alive. You're not dead. It's time to restore Israel to its kingdom power and rule because right now Rome is oppressing them and Rome is over them. And uh, they would like to be set free from Rome. And Jesus, it's time for you to get on a horse and valiantly lead the way, and let's take back our city. Right? That's what they thought. Now, in fairness, in Luke 22, Jesus does say that the disciples will be judges of, of all people. All right, in Luke 22, you can read that if you want, verse 30, that he, they will exercise authority over the tribes of Israel specifically. Okay? So they're thinking, is this the time? Are we going to be elevated? We're missing one disciple, though. Okay, Judas, he's gone. He died. But is it time for us to now, you know, begin to be over the 12 tribes of Israel? And, and Jesus, he says, well, it's not really up to you on that. It's not important right now. Um, the time that that's supposed to happen is not for you. You're on a need-to-know basis and you don't need to know. But verse eight says, so Jesus changes the subject to the most important part. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, there it is, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Right now, you don't need to worry about 
the, the kingdom of God being set up here on earth. Those times are not for you. Uh, but right now, what you need is power to be witnesses. You know what God spoke to me this past week is there's a lot of things we feel like we need in Christianity when this is really what we need. You know, I'm a pastor. You know, there's burdens of like functioning, the church functioning and, and all those things that we need as a church. Do you know what we need more than anything else in the church? The power of the Holy Spirit. God, forgive me if I ever ask for anything else more important than the power of of the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of God that we need, church. Whatever your personal struggle is, you need the power of the Holy Spirit. Whatever your family's going through, you need the Holy Spirit. That's the power you need to get through this season you're going through. And it's even more than that. He wants to give you his Spirit so that you will naturally and organically want to be witnesses for him starting in Dover or your town, and it spreads out. So telling people about me everywhere, starting in Jerusalem. This is the key verse of the book of Acts. Acts 1.8 is the key verse. It's the main verse of the entire book of Acts. And this is the same pattern for Jesus, as I said before. Before Jesus started his ministry, he needed the Holy Spirit. And you'll read in the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke, where he depended on the Holy Spirit to do things. Even after the temptation, it said that he was full of the Holy Spirit to go through that. But you will receive power. The word power in the Greek is dynamis. Does that sound familiar? Maybe where we get our word dynamite, dynamis, comes from a verb that means to be able to or to have strength. You will receive power. You will be able to be my witnesses. I don't feel able. Well, you need the power of the Holy Spirit because then you'll be able. I don't have the strength. That's okay. Guess what? The Holy Spirit is your strength to be witnesses. I love the fact that it's dynamite. What if we need to have a breakthrough in someone's situation and God uses uh, the gifts of the Spirit or the Holy Spirit to, to blow open uh, that wall that's keeping someone from the Lord through a miracle or something, and this dynamite power sets someone free from bondage and sin. Amen? And it says, you will be my witnesses. The word witnesses means uh, martyrs, actually. One who testifies. The word martyr means one who who testifies, and so some people died for testifying about Jesus. Some people did have a cross after Jesus. Others bore a cross and were nailed to a cross. So martyrs, someone who's willing to testify, be a witness of Jesus. Now, Jesus' words, look at this quote. It's from the Full Life Bible Commentary. Jesus' words, you will be my witnesses, has often been taken as a command but it's not so much as a command as it is a promise. When they receive the fullness of the Spirit, so you, you receive the Spirit of salvation, but you're going to have even more of the Holy Spirit, and in filling and fullness, overflowing of the Holy Spirit, when you receive that, the power they receive will inevitably transform them into witnesses. So when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you begin to be a witness because the Holy Spirit is working in you like that. He wants you, or you, you're going to want to shine. You're going to want to lead someone to the Lord. I was at a restaurant, uh, what night, Friday night. My wife and I got a date, and uh, we were out to eat. And the waitress looked very familiar. And I just couldn't tell how I knew her. And uh, I said, do you, do you go to churches nearby or something? You know, I wasn't trying to just throw out Calvary. Do you go to churches nearby? And she's like, oh, it's been a little while. No, and um, I was like, well, have you ever been to Calvary then at least? And she's like, well, I used to be a part of the G-team ministry. Pastor John used to come out to my neighborhood and talk about Jesus. I said, okay. Well, maybe I've seen you. I've been out there a couple of times as well, but maybe, maybe you visited. And she's like, well, my sister 
My sister does. And so I said, okay, that's pretty neat. Um, and she said, I need to get back there. I, I do need to go to church. Um, but anyway, we had a little small talk after that. She went away. And then someone who attends our church here ends up working at this restaurant and sees, sees us and goes and talks to our waitress. And she comes back and goes, hey, that, I won't say his name just because of, you know, I don't know if he wants to receive this, um, you know, public um, praise. But she said, hey, he, you know, do you know him? And I said, yeah, he goes to Calvary. And she goes, well, he just gave you a 25% discount. And I, and I was like, oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> I mean, I was, thank you, thank you, Jesus, you know. Um, and she's like, you know what, though? Here's the thing. She's like, him and his mom are such awesome people. I think I need to come to Calvary. <laughs> I mean, look at that. The testimony of your life is helping tell people about Jesus. I never would have written that. I couldn't make that happen by accident or anything. That was God working through a dinner that we actually didn't expect to even have or go do. And uh, we were able to encourage her and, and bless her with a nice tip and all those things, right? Being a witness is natural as that. But when you get set on fire by, by the Holy Spirit, oh my goodness, you're, just, you're like a witness everywhere you go. You can't contain the presence of God. Uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth in this verse. Do you know that the book of Luke actually is organized that way? That the first seven chapters is ministry in Jerusalem. Acts 8 through 12 is in Judea and Samaria. And Acts 13 through 28 covers the rest of the earth at that time. So Luke actually organized his book to show how the church started in Jerusalem and then spread to the ends of the earth at that time. Let me give you this, this statement. The mission of God is to preach the gospel to all nations. The method is followers of Christ. The ability and power to fulfill the mission is the Holy Spirit. It takes all three. And that's the main point of this entire book. I want to go to Acts 1, 9 through 11 now. And it's starting in verse 9. It says, after saying this, so after Jesus said, this is what you're supposed to be focusing on, being witnesses. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men, or angels, suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Amen. This had to happen because Jesus says, I will send you my spirit. When I leave, when I leave to go to the Father, I'm going to send you my spirit. He's going to be an advocate. And what it is is Jesus, when Jesus goes, the Holy Spirit is in his place on our behalf as an advocate. So we're not alone, and Jesus hasn't left us. He's working through his Holy Spirit. So they weren't going to be alone. He was going to send the Holy Spirit. Why is this so powerful? Because Jesus was localized into wherever he was. If he was in Galilee, Jesus was in Galilee. But now his presence goes everywhere through every believer around the world. His Holy Spirit is everywhere. Wow. And they're looking up because they, they, they're trying to see Jesus as long as they can. They're like, oh, there he goes to be with the Father. And here's the thing. He is before the Father interceding and praying for you right now, his word says. Interceding means to pray for you, to plead for you, okay? But what's his other job while he's up there? Pour out his spirit. Baptize you in the spirit. Somehow, in some way, I don't know how he does it, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father praying for you and also baptizing you, saturating you in the power of the Holy Spirit so you can be witnesses. This is what he's doing. He, he came to earth to save us. He dies. He's raised to life. 
He resurrected, right? And now he's ascended and he's still working on our behalf. How good is Jesus? We are so fortunate. Wow. But what matters to Jesus still is that you are clothed with power to reach the lost. I mean, this is what he's doing in heaven. He is pouring out his spirit and he's taking your life spiritually and he's dipping you or baptizing you in the spirit so that you can be effective witnesses for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's important to note too that his bodily ascension is the same way he will come back to take his church. So don't look, don't look on the earth for the Messiah because he's a false Messiah. We will all look to the sky and see the true Messiah coming down from the clouds. And the world will know that's the true Messiah. Amen. So let me land the plane. Let me finish up here. Here's some takeaways. Number one, we are worshipers and witnesses. We are worshipers and we are witnesses. Let me just speak from my heart on this. We're not meant to just be really good at worshiping. We're also meant to be really good at witnessing. Do we need to be um, proper in our worship? Do Do we need to be holy and pure? And should we be singing and should we be behaving properly and all those things? Absolutely. Worship is not just on Sunday mornings. Worship is obedient life to God. Okay? All those things are important. But we're also supposed to be witnesses. And here's what happens. The church, and we're going to read more about this next week, the church waited in prayer and worship, and that's when the Holy Spirit came upon them. So we need to be in worship. We need to be in prayer on Sundays and at home and in small groups, and we need to wait and ask for the Holy Spirit to come. Now, can I get kind of really honest about Christianity in America right now? Can I? Is it okay? This isn't just our church, I'm referring to all churches, okay? There is a lot of churches um, and a lot of Christians that know how to worship but don't know how to witness. And, you know, we have worship nights and all those things in Christianity in America. We got lots of worship albums, but we're not necessarily running to the conventions that talk about witnessing. Actually, you won't find many. And... I think part of that is because if we're honest, when we worship, we're not seeking the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, which we just heard from the Full Life Bible Commentary, that once we are baptized in the Spirit, we're going to want to be witnesses. So if you're in the camp that, that you love worshiping God, but you struggle to witness, guess what? You're not alone. And I got good news for you. If you ask and seek the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. The gift, if you ask God to baptize you in the Holy Spirit, you're gonna wanna witness all of a sudden, not just worship. It's just that, you know what? We haven't taught you that as pastors, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry that pastors are not talking about that, but there's a missing link between worship on Sundays and witnessing out in the community, and that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And if, if, if we could, can we together come on Sundays and want the presence of the Holy Spirit? Not that you don't. Don't get me wrong. You know, don't get me wrong. I don't, I, I don't get a chance to ask everyone on their way in, hey, are you seeking the Holy Spirit today? <laughs> you know, we all got different things and different things we're seeking, right? We need prayer for this, prayer for that. But I, see, I, see, I really do see, and in, in this scripture, Jesus is wanting them to wait. Before they do ministry, he knows they're going to need the power of the Holy Spirit. And he says, wait in Jerusalem until you receive the power to be witnesses. You know why? You can't be a witness without the strength of the Holy Spirit. That's why. You can't. Don't try it. I mean, you can if you want. Sure. Can your light shine so that all men may see your good deeds and glorify the Lord? Absolutely. That's in Scripture. But church, we're we're dealing with demon possession in our community. We're dealing with people who need healings and miraculous signs and wonders. I think we're going to need a little bit more. We're going to need a raging fire, not just this little light. 
We're going to need a lot of the Holy Spirit. So our passion will increase uh, it, for the lost if we have the Holy Spirit. And I've learned that from my own life. Man, when the Holy Spirit came upon me and baptized me, or when Jesus baptized me in the Holy Spirit and just saturated me in the Holy Spirit, Pastor Ryan was a different person as, as a young man. I, I wanted to witness. I, I cared about the lost. I had a burden for the lost like I never had before. And so sometimes we're like, Ryan, how do we get that burden? How do we, how do we, have, how do we care for the, that the lost are lost and, and start reaching them? I would say have the, the missional spirit in your life. The spirit of God is missional. He's on mission, and he's ready to fill you. Clark Pinnock, in his book, Flame of Love, A Theology of the Holy Spirit, said this. God wants a community that, like Jesus, gets caught up in the transformation of the world. I love that. He wants a church that's caught up, really concerned and burdened for the transformation of the world. Calvary, let us be that. Let us be a church that's burdened and concerned for the loss and want to see the world transform. And last, last takeaway, the baptism in the Holy Spirit is a gift God wants us to have. He actually wants you to have this gift. I, uh, I love the holidays. I love uh, waiting, you know, for those times to give those gifts to our kids. Um, how many of you, you know, growing up as a kid, grandma and grandpa were on their way over, and they gave you a little teaser that the gift of the Holy Spirit, or sorry, the gift that they have is on the way, right? And so I, it's kind of funny. And my parents, they would go on uh, ministry trips, and they would always bring us a gift. And I feel so bad, but I'm waiting at the door for my parents to come, and all I could think about is a gift, not my parents. <laughs> bad Ryan. I was young. They distracted me with the gift. He wants to give you the gift, and he's on his way. What if we came to church, or what if you went home today and waited in your prayer closet or whatever place that you have that you've set up as an altar or a place of worship this week, and you said, Lord, I believe in this gift, the baptism of your spirit's power. I'm waiting, and I know it's going to set me on fire to be a witness for you. I want to see our community transformed, and I need your power to do it. I need your fire to do it your presence, and you wait, and you pray expectantly for the gift to come. That's how I was baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. I went to a, uh, the chapel at Valley Forge, and while I was there, I was actually studying the book of Acts for one of my classes, one of my courses in college, and I said, Lord, I have never properly waited on you for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and it was in that moment that God began to break me for what breaks him, his heart, and that's the lost. And the Holy Spirit came over me, and I began to pray in a language I did not know. And next thing you know it, I was just ready for ministry. I was ready to go wherever God had me to go, and then the church ended up hiring me here. Um, and wow, I just thank God. And I continue to ask and receive the filling of the Holy Spirit to help me be a witness. Why don't we stand together? Thank you for the extra time today. It's so important that we know this so that we can properly seek his gift, properly wait and receive. So ask God for the gift of the Holy Spirit's power for witnessing. Ask him. Begin to have the ask come out in your prayer life, asking him. Wait expectantly in prayer and worship for the Father's gift. Jesus is going to meet you where you are. Jesus is going to meet you where you are, and he wants to baptize you in his presence. I hope this helps. You may want to listen to this again on YouTube um, and just hear, you know, the doctrine and the teaching of the differences, too, with salvation and water baptism and spirit baptism. But I wanted to start with this, and we'll get more into the experience as we move forward. But next week, we're going to read how the church had to wait before they were filled with and baptized by the Holy Spirit.
Amen. In the meantime, go and show the love of God. Go be witnesses. All right? Begin to obey the Lord on that, and he will give you his spirit to help you. Amen? All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word today. We believe it. This was Jesus, your son, telling his disciples to wait for your gift, the baptism, the saturation of the Holy Spirit, the power we need to be witnesses. And Lord, we thank you that when your baptism comes over us, there's even a greater burden for you, for, for holiness, for your word, for your mission, for the lost, to use our gifts, to walk and follow in the steps of the Holy Spirit. So Lord, I pray, God, that we today, knowing this knowledge now, knowing these truths, that we would begin to add this in our prayer life and ask and wait for your power from the Holy Spirit. Thank you for saving us, Lord, and if there's anyone here right now that needs to believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, begin to ask him, begin to confess your sins and ask him to forgive you, to come into your life, and you will be changed, you will be saved, you will be transformed by the washing of the Holy Spirit, and then begin to ask him for the power of the Holy Spirit to be witnesses. God, we thank you for this word. Be with everyone here. Keep us safe as we go our separate ways, but still united as one body in Christ. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.